actually not the typical podcast situation today because we have the Audi Max with like 300 people listening to the podcast. Usually it's me, Michael, my podcast partner, and then our guests, let's say one or two guests. Like never more than four people because it's very hard to follow more than four people like who's talking now. And um, what we do in the, in the odd, like, the name came by accident to us on the way to New York because I actually made a typo in one of the videos when we were flying to New York and I wanted to write on the way to New York and um, I wrote on the way to New York. Uh, that's how it came to us. Uh, now we know that New York is much more than that but what is so interesting about this New York concept and that's what the podcast actually did, it's always showing the, the person behind the role that the person is playing. and. When you're asking like how do we prepare, I actually never prepare. <laughs> Michael prepares a lot much better. So since he's still on vacation, he wrote me, hey, make sure you read about Dirk. We're meeting uh, Dirk um, Albon from Hyperloop and read about him and, and the company and of course, but he's, he anyways needs to share these details. Like I don't play a role in showing with good questions that I'm well prepared. Like, what I always think is, what is a good question to help others feel that they are in the same room, even if they are not, without trying to show something with a question, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, so I, I, I can see, but how do, you, how do you make sure you don't lose track of what you actually want to know of a person when you, you, know, when you don't have a specific frame, framework in which you want to you want to keep the conversation, you know, so it can, what I can imagine is that if you don't prepare anything is that sometimes the conversation goes on a pant afterwards, you see, okay, one hour I spent with this person didn't really go in the direction I wanted to make it go before we met. Yeah. How does this never happen? So, A, this never happened so far. There are conversations that are difficult. Let's say because the person is usually like answering with yes or no, but that's because you then ask a close question. But I don't want to lead it in a certain direction. I don't want. I like. I want to explore. I want to get to know the person, and that's why this question of who are you in like not two or three sentences, but as Michael usually says, like 20, 30 sentences, is so important. Yeah. There are people who tell a lot about themselves and they think, but that's boring. It's not. You get to know a person like deep down and understand what is the motive, what drives him. And of course, you then come to certain aspects. And I'm usually not sad if we missed out a certain point because we don't want to reveal anything that differentiates us from a journalist who has the task to find something out and write a story. We're documenting a conversation between two people or three people or four people mm -hmm. and um, that's the power of a podcast and to me this is also the power of like using video as a tool of course like my meme is create which doesn't necessarily mean you make up a story the more authentic you keep it the better the energy in the room and I don't want to lead in a certain direction. I don't want to force anyone to tell a story they don't want and make them feel uncomfortable. Of course, it's interesting to challenge, but the most important thing is then to listen closely, like what is he saying? What is, what is the next question I would like to ask? But still listen to what and how he is saying that, or she is saying that. You mentioned that you, you have to listen, you really have to listen to the person in yeah. order to make up a good conversation. So what is your trick when listening to what somebody says? In order to make conversation flow and, and make it interesting as well. So, what what do you want? What do you want to get out of of a, of a, of a, of a personal conversation when you have? When I when I sit there to record a podcast, even if it, there is an audience, mm -hmm. I completely and I will also tell it to the audience. Sorry if I miss out on you guys. You yeah. are not here for me right now. Okay. because I really need to focus on that one person. I cannot do like two or more things at the same time, even if some people say I, I try to do, but I don't, I can't. So I really have to focus on that person and then listen to what he is saying. And that's, I said like, of course, if you have someone who's answering in very short sentences, yeah. then it's hard. But then is also the question, why do you want to be in a podcast if you like don't want to share your stuff? Yeah, that's true. So that's the question. Yeah. Um, 
if you have, let's say we had the, um, Friedrich Bergman, the in inventor of new work um, in the podcast, which was a three hour podcast because we said like he's 88 years old, he was in hospital at that time, um, he still wanted to record the podcast. We said we won't give him a time slot when to end. Yeah. And we sent everything uncut, even if we were repeating certain things. But you, you get this feeling you're in this room with him in the podcast. And I don't want to look at a paper in my questions and what I tried. I, of course, I kind of like this time I was going through YouTube videos on the plane from Dirk. Um, like see how he talks, how he is as a person, because we have not much time to get to know each other. Yeah. Um, also the company and the idea behind it. And of course, when I first heard Hyperloop, I said, oh, that's Elon Musk's idea. Yeah, but that's not interesting. What is interesting, like what I'm interested in is like, why is Dirk so motivated to like change transportation? Mm -hmm. Just because he's, he freaks out about like waiting in line at the airport or like yeah. what's the, the thing with it? And that's much more interesting than everything else around it. And then the other thing that interests me, he had a very innovative way to like get started with this community of people who were involved. I think they got kind of the stock option for investing 10 hours a week if they commit to 10 hours a week. Yeah. That's kind of a new work, work model. Mm -hmm. And I want to learn about things he does differently in his company and how they organize and stuff like that. How do you usually get to know the person you're talking to in a podcast? Is it you, you, you make up a meeting, you say, okay, we want to film a po or we want to, want to record a podcast, and then, and then you meet for one hour, and then it's okay, goodbye, thanks for, uh, for the conversation? Or do you have a prehistory, or, or do you stay in contact afterwards? So, so how's, how's your relationship with them? We, we meet them, and then we take time, so minimum half an hour to like have a coffee or talk, or walk around when they're in, at the office, see the office, like like get a little bit of this energy and atmosphere around it. And then we sit down and then the most important thing, as I said, is they don't have the feeling or get the feeling we want to reveal something. We're there to like get to know them. So they can also bring the conversation in a certain direction. And I'm usually very quiet in the beginning of the podcast and Michael is like more diving into it and then I'm, I'm listening carefully and then I dive into certain questions and I don't want to reach a certain goal in the podcast. So there is no need for me to, I don't know, show something or do something. Of course, I have certain people where I have much more to meet, so for example, I'm always big about tools and, and G Suite and Salesforce and all that stuff. So if someone has has it in company, I also share then a story that we had and so on. And it can happen that it's repetitive because I forgot I did that already. Yeah. And Michael sometimes does, this, does the same. And then we immediately get feedback, oh, you shared that again. And then of course, and I say, thank you for the feedback, it's good. But in the end, you know what? It's my conversation. Yeah. Like, you don't need to follow it if you don't want. It's part of the whole package that you buy. Yeah, I very much have the impression that you two guys kind of go about the podcast in a way where you say, okay, we want to appreciate the conversation we have and, and we want to show it more or less uncut and raw as, a, as the conversation was. And you take your liberty to, to do it that, that, uh, that way. Yeah. And it seems to be working out pretty, pretty well. So you've mentioned before that you've got a uh, Quite a, quite a lot of listeners uh, every every time on, on SoundCloud, for example. So, how yeah. do you think your team, so you and Michael, give give rise to that to that popularity of your podcast? So, how do you work together mm -hmm. in order to make it such a flexible and open way of communicating? To so, it's not like the podcast is. We call it our hobby because it's not a company. It it has a huge impact on both of us, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, when I think why is it taking off, it's the topic of new work, it's the guests, it's definitely the guests and not us. Um, we both have social media reach for sure, like Michael a lot on LinkedIn. Uh, my reach is more YouTube, so we are a podcast that you can also like see on our YouTube channel quite often. Um, and people follow that. Of course, my YouTube videos are also about different topics, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, so this is definitely part of it. And then this 
actually, <laughs> the, if you ask me if there's one thing that you need to do to make that work, yeah. you just have to keep going. It sounds so stupid okay. and there are so many people saying that, but it's true. We made 100 podcasts now. I think we made beyond 250 YouTube videos, MP roughly, something like that, around 250. So that's a lot of videos, that's a lot of podcasts. And if you have the feeling I need to reach something with one video or with one podcast and you look at the numbers all the time, you're out of focus. Yeah. And I love this process. I love to create stuff and it has a huge impact on my company, but not directly. Just because, I don't know, someone sees something and then they come back to us. But you could not measure it number by number. But you can say there is a there, there is a huge part of projects, I would say all of the projects we currently do, yeah. you can um, go back to them and, say, and relate to the podcast or the videos. Okay. Wow. So when, when, when was it? Who were your first listeners? Who were the first listeners of the podcast? Wow, oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. So the first, it's the, the videos were before the podcast. I can like the videos. Um, I did videos for a long time, but not in a in, in a high frequency. So the first videos were shared on Facebook and then LinkedIn and Xing. And there are a lot of people who follow us from the first day. Um, but beyond friends and family, actually beyond friends and family. So I would even say friends. Um, often say, oh, it's annoying, you post too much, why do you do that? And then I usually say, well, I already use public profiles, I don't use my private Facebook profile, I use a public page. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you don't need to follow me, there is no yeah. obligation to do that, like, so you don't do it. So um, usually it's someone else, but I cannot tell you exactly who it was. Uh, what I can tell you is that the guys who watch the videos are completely different ones compared to the podcast okay yeah, very interesting so yeah. podcast is more a bit older mid-20s more business so that direction and videos what younger I, what, yeah. I, what i'd say is that podcast is kind of a revival at the moment right or wouldn't you, wouldn't you say so? definitely that's also a reason why it's uh, taking off i mean um i would still say the long-term best investment is YouTube, I would always say that because it's so hard to grow on YouTube these days if you don't do it in a professional, frequent, high frequency way. Yeah. And it's so strong in terms of search, credibility, because people see what effort you put into that work because yeah. it's so hard to put out a video. Um, podcast, super popular because you can consume it on the go, in the car and so on. A very good way to consume and definitely on the rise also based on Spotify and yeah. how popular SoundCloud is and all these these tools yeah so so was there a point where you had or where you felt okay now the thing is is picking up and it, it is going by itself so was there a point where you saw okay now I've made my friends my colleagues and, 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 and maybe also clients aware of my podcast and then at some point you saw okay wow uh, listening listening numbers are going up and I'm, I'm I'm just doing the same, doing it the same way, but it's increasing more or less exponentially. Um, yeah. uh, the reach is increasing. Was there a point where you could say, okay, wow. Well, kind of mm, so and so, because there's not one point, mm -hmm. but it grew faster and faster. Yeah. Same true for YouTube. Um, again, from this keeping going and like make another one, make another one. We never missed a week of podcast. And we rarely missed, missed a week of YouTube videos. So, so how, how do you manage time-wise with social life, work, I don't know. I mean, podcast is a hobby, of course, but how, how do you fit in content, people, connections into that? I, I guess it's a yeah. pretty big project. So it's, not, um, it's Luckily, we are three managing directors at Blackboard. Um, one is doing the technical part, the tools and so on. One is doing the change management, the transformation part, the trainings. And one is doing the content and creation. And uh, this grew from that. So the hard year was 2016-17. Yeah. I was doing most of the videos on my own. Um, now we are a team, MP is part of the team. Um, we have more editing support to manage that, yeah. to keep going. Okay. 
but it's still a lot of work and um, I try to focus on the content. Mm -hmm. So creating the content, holding the keynotes yeah. and the clients who are important, like large enough um, and need the attention. These are my tasks, but um, it's, it's a commitment. But I won't sacrifice certain things for sure, but I love to create. I love to like sit in front of a screen, see the edit, see a result, okay. upload a video, um, see how a podcast takes off. And I love that. And I don't care too much if there's like one or two in between that are not that good. I don't freak out about it because tomorrow we upload a new one. <laughs> so that's okay. Yeah. And um, that's the big difference to, to the old days when you had like content and it need to be polished and perfect and yeah. fine. And now you're like, you like let people participate in that. And you cannot fail if you produce. Mm -hmm. You cannot fail because you're a small group of people who actually produce and create. The much, much larger group of people consume or maybe comment and, and engage, but the much larger group is consuming yeah. and wants to consume. So you can always win when you're on the side of the creators. Okay. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you, you're quite, a, as, as you mentioned, you're quite a creative, or creative creator, so to say. And um, when, you, when you listen to your podcast, it also always comes out that you, you love making videos and, and showing, showing the content that you produce. So how did you start out with it? When, when, when was the point you, you started doing videos, editing uh, uh, snippets of, of pictures and stuff? Was it, was it a school day? You know, the, the start week in St. Gallen for the newbies? Yeah. I made the video in 2003. You want to see it? I'll show it to you later. <laughs> um, this is actually how I met Adrian Locher, my good business partner and friend. We were together on the media team. Um, I did, my, my dad had a camera, a VHS camera and a Super 8 camera, and I could play around with it actually. Yeah. Um, and he was perfectly fine and I started to like press play and pause to make edits like cuts yeah. so my brother had for example to jump from uh, we had a bunker in the in the garden like an old one and um, where, where you had this this air um, chimney um, he had to jump off that thing after I uh, set off a rocket like like stunt masters and he jumped from that which was pretty crazy because it was quite high um, stuff like that and I just enjoyed that process yeah. and I kind of forgot about that when I started working and diving too much into work and I kind of lost like this true thing I wanted to do especially after St. Gallen I have to say because we were working a lot a lot of my friends were going to banks or consultancies yeah. and I thought okay this is now the way to go and um, I, I kind of forgot about my creative side yeah. And I had, when we had our daughter in 2015, we took three months off and went to Canada to travel. And I always need to do something and I felt bad that I had this feeling because I thought, I'm here with the family, you shouldn't do something. And, and then I recognized, but why do I need, why do I feel bad? Because I love to do things. Yeah. Then I bought a camera, DSLR, Canon, uh, and uh, looked at some YouTube videos because I never actually learned filming or editing, I just did it. So I just learned about shutter speed, ISO, aperture and all the stuff you, you, you need to know and um, started filming and then I recognized, well, movie after movie, it changes. So with the first one it was really bad, then it got better and got better and got better and since I published in two videos a week, yeah. which is then like eight a month, after like three months I was kind of... Uh, professional or semi-professional in what I was doing yeah. and people would now say I'm always hacking the things and I don't do it the correct way but I find a way how to do it yeah. and this is this is how it came back to me and this felt just so right and so good that even when critics were coming and saying oh there are too many videos from you and I hate the videos and there are, there were so many more people giving good feedback not like I like the video but I took a lot away from it yeah. and we were giving away so much content that they were saying that's so helpful and I said well it just can be good in the end for yeah. something and it was and this is then how it took off that's also why I film as often as I can myself or yeah. 
also do edits by myself. And then when MP and I have a creative session, when we're on the go, for example, like tomorrow, we took a later flight back. So we have a couple of hours just in the hotel, just the two of us editing, okay. which is then this creative part that I really love. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. And I would never want to give that up. Mm-hmm. And so since you started with the podcast, what's the, for you as the producer of this, of this content, what's for you the biggest difference in, um, in, 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 in the production, on the production side? So I mean, mm-hmm. on one hand, you only, the consumer only hears your voice. On the other hand, he sees your face combined with the voice. Although the information could also be shared in a, maybe, I don't know, maybe in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, in a sound memo. So yeah. what's, what's the biggest difference? In, Super interesting question because there are many. Oh wow! This is, by the way, why I love Switzerland back there. We have a wide angle; it's very hard to see that, but uh, that's the view we had. We didn't have too much time when we were studying to go into the mountains. Okay, um, so the difference there is a huge difference. So there are people recording podcasts and just film it and let it go. We did that with one or two videos on YouTube, but. A video itself, a movie, has its own rules, its own context. You use the image to show something and by definition it was called manipulation, like you manipulate the image. This is what a video per definition or movie does. So you do that, you tell the story by using the cuts, the edits. So I was cutting in a certain way and P cuts in a different way. If we are vlogging we're more documenting and then use the create part to like tell a certain story or find a certain topic in a podcast it's and 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 you cannot just listen to the video you can but the best part is the image i mean we invested in a red camera which is completely an overkill for youtube but we didn't bring it today because it's an overkill for a vlog but that's what we usually film on and um, in a podcast you develop the interesting thing is you develop a audio a voice brand people recognize your voice you have much more time to get into a certain topic and listening and following a conversation is like more you sit in the room and listen to someone and i sometimes have the feeling that people feel like and i don't know if it's like that but when you were a young child you were listening to adults to parents to something interesting and you could follow that as a good story this is how you feel if you listen to a podcast. Yeah. A video, you're much more like, I want to be entertained, I want to see something and still per- participate from that, yeah. but much different. So that's why you could never do two at the same time. Of course, we will record the podcast and we will use certain like certain excerpts from it, but not everything, usually not everything. Yeah, so, so would you say a podcast allows the, the listener more to feel part of the conversation than watching a conversation in a YouTube video, for example? I would say yes, but still we sometimes just make a YouTube video with a conversation. We just uploaded one on Tuesday, 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. On my wife does our workspace series on Sunday, which is sometimes an hour, walk around through an office, and people follow that all the way through. They then open the video and let it run in the background, but they want to hear all the details, which is very interesting to see. Yeah. And I personally like this way of making a movie like manipulating images to transport a message like when we did this video from Fritjof Bergman with a message where he shares about um, you don't need to be afraid or I'm like well okay then I'm afraid but that's okay I face it very emotion very emotional and very hard to get that emotion if you don't listen to the three hours yeah. if you want to transport it in three minutes to like reach more people you need to manip- manipulate it and then you bring across the message. That's why I think communication is such a strong skill these days because we're so distracted with so many things and to reach people that's a superpower I would say. Yeah. And we're still on the way. <laughs> we're not finished yet. <laughs> well, that's, that's what your podcast is all about, right? Yeah. Finding the way. Very good questions. Thank you so much for that. So I think we now recorded that, so that's why we will definitely also share that, even if that was a conversation. How long was it? We were, we were talking for 25 minutes. We will definitely share that. That's uh, <laughs> good questions. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you guys. If you followed through all the way, make sure you subscribe if you like that kind of stuff here. And there's another video for you to watch. And we also link the 
Sankan Symposium YouTube channel. You guys have a YouTube channel still, right? Uh, well, yes, we have. We have. We live there. We're all president of social media. Awesome. Thanks.